Susan, you got in? I'm getting there, right? I think it's just getting there. <clears throat> Do we get to the network? Just put it in your hand. You need to get in the network. Oh, the gas. You're here with me, so let's see if I can run two at once. I voted. So, so what you get for getting here early, Mr. Upper? I got a nice Chromebook from Scott, so it opens, everything's saved. <laughs> He's voted. <laughs> There's seven of them right there on the yeah, counter that's, that's, that's what they're there for. Maybe we should put Ellie on one of those? Sure. Should we try it? All right, can we get that in? Did it put you in two places? It did. She's in on me. I just want to know it's going to work. Um, just waiting for Susan and Do you want to? Yeah. Okay, that's unanimous. All right. Um, can I get a motion to convene executive session to discuss the employment of particular people? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Susan's still laughing, so I figured you'd be here. Thank you. I'm going to bring my hand. All right. Is the video? Yes. Can I get a, a motion to reconvene out of uh, executive session? Second. Second. Anybody here for public input one, please come up to the podium, state your name. Uh, you'll have three minutes, and please do not mention any individuals' names and students. Uh, is anyone here? Please come up. Hi, my name is Caleb Kershaw. Thank you, Um I'm concerned with what's, to me, a rush to appoint two positions that were announced last Wednesday. The deadline was Friday, that's two days, and you're appointing those next. Now I know they've worked here, and they might be super qualified. This is not a judgment against their qualifications whatsoever. It's about the procedures. I think in my term, in my view, when you announce a, a position, is to get a wide range of maybe very talented people from your community that you could actually draw upon. And um, with this sort of like Wednesday, closed on Friday, appointment today, it just doesn't feel like that. Um, and what I really, what it, what's, I, I see here now, I don't want to get specific about it, but what's really alarming to me about it is it sets a standard that people won't, you're trying to engage the community to be part of the school. And when you do something like this, what people say is, uh, I'm not going to bother. It's an inside job. I'm not going to bother because they've already decided who's going to do this or do that. <coughs> and it doesn't really give you the chance to see who's available here. And they could be less qualified or they could be more qualified. I'd ask questions that I don't think anybody will answer. But how many applications did you have? How many did you interview? Um, I think with two days' notice, I, I can assume not many. And it, it makes it alarming to me. And as a, somebody, uh, a taxpayer here, I want somebody who has been vetted and from a large pool of the community. So that's my concern. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here for public input one? All right. Um, so, we want to. 
section of I, President's comments. I don't have anything other than to introduce our new super interim superintendent, Ellie Tritt. We are so happy to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. And I also want to indicate I'm absolutely delighted to be here. St. Harbor is an exceptional community and an exceptional school district. Um, after being here just two days, the most striking feature is how well the staff works together. They're an amazing team, positive, everyone loves their work, everyone ships in to help other people out. Everybody's walking around smiling. Um, the children, as you walk through the hall, the children are energetic and involved and there's interaction. Um, attended um, the snowflake tea and grandparents and parents were involved with the children and it was just a, a beautiful opportunity of a successful school district and the feeling just permeates everyone. And an additional aspect which I think people may be uh, accustomed to is the blend of the traditions and the history uh, and the, the uh, wonderful when you drive through the streets, you see old streets and you see each houses and everything is individual as opposed to um, where I live where everything is brand new and kind of vacuous and here you have the history that the children have the opportunity to absorb and, and see where they came from and the, the history at the same time that you're at the cutting edge with the arts and the technology so you're blending the old and the new in, in a beautiful way so it's just a, a wonderful opportunity for the children in the community to really get the most of, best of all possible worlds so um, I'm really happy to be here and, and join with you so thank you. Thank you. Can I just add, I want to thank <coughs> Principal Nichols for uh, over the past several weeks and months really just really helping out in the transition and stepping up and that he's been a big asset during this transition period. I'm sure he will continue to be so. Absolutely. Jeff has been amazing uh, in, in just pitching on and doing things and working very long. Thank you. Many time. administrators have <laughs> stepped up. Yes. <laughs> thank you all. Okay, so uh, moving on to the administrator's report. Um, we're gonna start with the facilities report, which I believe um, is just going to be, uh, Paul couldn't be here, but I think we're just gonna have a update with respect to Sag Harbor Learning Center by Tim. Just that I don't think it's uh, Yeah, it's not in the order. It's, just it's not Ed yet, though, it's Tim first. We don't know if the administrators prefer to do what the order of the PowerPoint is. It's whichever. Start with him. It sounds like you got it. Up. Top left is a the where the <coughs> in the classrooms we have uh, the big screen TVs that are going in the corner. Um, that's uh, some of the acoustic panels that are being installed behind those. Um, the picture on the left is it's hard to give you the uh, floor designs in the classrooms. But those are what the floors look like in all the classrooms uh, on the first floor. Um, we are installing doors today uh, downstairs. I believe all the doors are in downstairs. Um, the picture in the bottom center is the, I guess, the training room. Uh, with that looks the same at the other end, uh, with the screens mounted on the wall. It's the same on the other end two screens, I guess eventually we're gonna, I won't, but I think they're gonna put a divider in there uh, to separate that room and to use it as one big, one big room altogether. Um, the 
picture in the center is the first stages of the gym floor. Um, the second stage in that process went down today. Um, that progresses each day. There's a there's a step each day that they do. Um, they will be complete with that at the end of the week, and then it'll have a cure time of about 10 days. The picture on the right is just a look down the hallway of, of the business offices. All the doors are in. Uh, the casework is in. Everything's pretty much complete downstairs, with the exception of the corridor floor, which they will be starting on tomorrow morning. These are some pictures upstairs on the first floor. This is the corridor looking as you walk in the building. Um, you can see all the door frames are in. Uh, the floor will be one of the last things that will be going in uh, upstairs. Uh, tomorrow we're laying out the paint schemes on the walls for the uh, designs on the walls to accompany the door frames. The casework on the right is a uh, indicative of all the classrooms with the sinks and, and uh, drinking fountains. Uh, those are all installed. It's another picture of the acoustic panels. Um, and that's just to try to give you a little bit broader view of the, uh, the classrooms. You can see the floor design and the ceilings and the soffits. Um, and it's uh, as close to the original drawings that you guys looked at uh, months ago. Um, they all are pretty close uh, in design. Another picture of the hallway down through the front. Um, some of the tiles are missing to let those guys work so we don't handle those uh, too often and damage those tiles. So that's why you see some of the tiles out from the ceiling. Um, I don't know if Ed forwarded the uh, milestone schedules. I don't. I know that you guys were looking for them at the end of last week. I know Ed had some. Yeah, he sent them to us earlier today. So, <clears throat> really, um, overall, we're on schedule for the 31st. Um, there are two issues that we have that won't affect um, the overall schedule in terms of people in the building or uh, a certificate of occupancy. Um, we have an issue with the elevator uh, right now that was a layout issue with the elevator company. Um, I don't anticipate that running past the 31st they made a commitment to do everything they can to get it done by the 31st. Um, what happened was they laid the door frames out wrong. The masons put them in where they laid them out, and they were two inches off. So we had to take those door frames out, uh, move them over two inches. Um, it was a challenge to get the masons back on site and to get those frames out without damaging them. All that cost is incurred by Otis. It's not anything that's going to be reflected on the district. It's something that they've owned up to and happens. Um, the other uh, issue that we have right now is a couple of the pieces of casework were uh, wrong. Um, we opted not to reorder those. Those are going to take those back to the shop work those, they can do them in the shop quicker than they can rebuild them. Um, hopefully those will be in uh, in the course of business next week, um, but it will not affect any of the rooms or uh, having those finished by the 31st. Um, we, will, uh, we will be working every day that's available. Um, like I said, we are on schedule for the 31st. Um, I will be out <coughs> on vacation next week, but somebody from my company will be here covering, so and I'll be available. So if there's any issues, the good part is we're over the hump. 
most of the major construction work is done. Right now we're doing finishes and paint, clean up, getting stuff ready for punch list. Um, so um, again, we'll be done by the 31st. I'll be back from vacation. We will generate a punch list and um, hope we can get you guys in there Has the punch list been started? <coughs> no, that's something that we, I haven't got uh, this week. I'll get a, um, <coughs> they have to send me a letter for substantial completion, and then that'll generate a punch list for that particular trade. I anticipate all those to be done by the time I get back from vacation. So, Ed, and I will go through and generate a punch list um, the first week of January. Um, and that'll be minimal. Um, right now I try to keep everything that we can that's gonna be a major item on a punch list or something that's gonna be addressed to try to get it taken care of now. Hopefully it'll be cosmetic stuff and minor issues that we need to deal with on a punch list. It'll be fairly short. What's your expectation on the timing of completing that? For the punch list? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, there's some things I know you, you, you probably aren't aware of yet, but generally speaking, is it a month? Is it two months? No. I, I, once we, I mean, our completion date for the 31st stands, I would anticipate within the next 30 days everything should be complete. Okay. By the end of January, the punch list should be complete. Um, there's outstanding issues on the project that still need to be addressed, retaining wall, you know, other things that you guys are aware of, but nothing that will uh, inhibit moving in the building or a certificate or opening the classroom. I think anything else? Thank you. Thank Does you. anyone else want to speak about the Center of Learning Center in terms of the um, administration? What do you mean by administration? We have Ed coming and speaking next, and then Jeff is going to speak. Okay, so I'll listen to Jeff. Good. Yep. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Tim. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think um, Scott Ed is going to call in, or we're calling him. Ed Bernhauer speaking. Hey, Ed, it's Scott Fisher. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're good. You're, uh, you're with the group. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, the time this evening. Hi, Ed. Hi, He's an avatar. I know. <laughs> and can you, uh, you, He's literally can, on the phone. Can you still hear us? Yes, yeah, we okay. can hear you. You can go right ahead. Okay, so um, the document that I have up, I believe, um, is the fund summary that was sent from our office. Uh, do you guys have that in front of you? No. Nope. Who was that sent to? Uh, you don't. Um, uh, that was... Let's see, I'm just double checking. Uh, I think 
We're using um, Scott's computer, right? So if he was to email it to you, he, he could get it up quick, quickly? Yep. Yep, so if you could email it sure. to Scott. Yep. Yes, you bet. Ed, did you uh, send it to Scott? Yep, it just went out of my outbox, so you guys should have it just momentarily. Awesome. Is it on that email you sent? And this was a document. I was just going to check for everyone, so we um, no, this was a document. So I'll double check the send date. It's on the screen, but it is a um, little, little hard to, to see. Yeah, I'll try to print it out. For you, Go ahead. It's pretty high resolution uh, PDF, guys. You should be able to zoom in on it. Well, then we won't see the whole thing. It's fitting in the screen. I'm going to try to print out some copies, so you can go ahead and, and talk. Okay. So what I'll just explain is um, this is a document that we provided in the, in the past um, that uh, you may recall you've seen before. This is where we track... Uh, the uh, prime contractors on the bonded side of the project. Uh, and this is the latest version uh, that we um, uh, sent over to the district. Uh, and I was just double checking that date. Uh, I believe it was to Lori Baum, uh, uh, Jeff Nichols, um, Paul Wilkin, and Katie Gray. And I believe that was on December 6th. Yeah. So it shows that, um, uh, you know, all track all of the costs for those prime contractors, uh, and it shows kind of the uh, um, the base cost, the change orders, any field directive allowances that were utilized. And then we also track, as you can see in red, um, upcoming costs that we're currently reviewing uh, that the contractors have submitted. It might be helpful if you went through and explained it a little bit. Um. Sure. Um, so as you're looking at your screen, uh, one of the things that you'll see um, on the left-hand side, uh, right at the top, you'll see general construction, renew contracting. So this is one of our prime contracts. And what we list is as we move over to the right-hand side in those headings, you'll see our SED number there for the project. And then you'll see two columns. One is instruction side and incidental side. Now the incidental, uh, when we're talking about the prime contractors, is really site work. Uh, so really that's how SED breaks down their contractors into uh, prime construction and site work construction. 
And you'll see that the first number that you see in black there uh, is under construction under the GC, which is $2,176,497, was their base bid, uh, um, prime contract bid, uh, when we awarded the project for the building side of their contract. Then you'll also see the $262,000 that was for the site work portion of their contract for a total of $2,438,497. So as you can see there, that's their, their base contract. Then as we move down, you'll see any change orders that we've executed with them. So uh, the first one is, the first two here actually revolve around on site. We did have um, hazardous material uh, containing soil that needed to be mitigated and removed. And so uh, those two change orders there that have been executed on the site work side, as you can see it from the incidental side, um, were to remove that contaminated soil. Then you'll see uh, uh, several other red change orders that we're currently reviewing with the district. Um, one is for, a lot of these are for uh, kind of infrastructure item related items and changes based on some of the existing infrastructure after we've opened up the wall. And these ones here, as you can see in red, as I said, are not executed yet because we're currently reviewing the costs with the contractors. Um, each one of them has particular items that the contractor needs to resubmit or reevaluate as far as their costs based on our, um, based on our review. And so you can see as we move over to the, the right hand side of the page, there are totals everything up for us. Um, and then also uh, what you'll see over to the side is the invoice to date is how much the contractor has actually uh, requisitioned for through their pay application process. And then to the right of that, you'll see uh, allowances remaining. That's the amount of their field directive allowance, which is included in their base bid number. So that's um, money to be utilized um, that could be used against some of these red change orders that we're taking a look at or uh, other things that might pop up in finishing off the work they have in the building. And as we move down, you'll see um, for the mechanical construction contract, which is the second one, that's our DNS mechanical services. Um, currently, there's a red change order there, uh, and you'll see a zero amount. That's because the contractor, um, uh, we indicated, hasn't finalized the amount yet. Now, this particular one, we just did receive a uh, cost estimate from the contractor on um for these adding these three additional heating units uh that were requested and that would be twenty seven thousand we're currently reviewing that cost to make sure it's accurate and make sure that the labor rates are all in line with uh the new york state required labor rate uh and so once that um that number is finalized we'll present that to the district uh, to see if they want to proceed with that particular one then as we move down um electrical construction You'll see we do have, um, whenever you see a number like you see under the electri electrical construction contract that's in parentheses, that's a credit that's coming back towards the district. Um, this was something where it was included um, for actually hooking up kitchen equipment uh, that the district has not decided to purchase yet. So that money that was included in their bid to do that is being credited back towards the district and you know, that's denoted with that parentheses that you see there. There was also a change order executed for exterior lighting um, repair and replacement. Uh, it was thought to originally use the existing exterior light wall packs that were there. Um, but once we got into the actual renovations, it was found that um, some of the wiring was actually coming back with fault and some of the wiring was not working. So um, the district instructed us to proceed with uh, replacing that exterior lighting. And then also similar, there's a circuit in the boiler room that we're currently evaluating uh, a cost to replace just because of the existing condition. And then as we go down, uh, the last contract uh, for the bid contract was the plumbing contract. Uh, currently there was just one uh, change order where we were going to uh, reuse, um, or we were going to actually um, do a toilet room that's on the lower level uh, through other sources, but the district came back and said they would rather have it on the prime contract, so we added it to the plumbing contract. 
and then also here the credit back for uh, not hooking up the kitchen equipment um, that comes back towards the district. And then the last contract that we do list on here because it is um, part of the bonded side, however, it wasn't publicly bid, it was a cooperative purchase uh, that the district engaged in, was for the main roof over the learning center. Um, and you see that here with Garland's company. And there were no, no change orders uh, as part of that contract. So any questions uh, on the formatting of the fund summary? I have questions on the content. So, yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, Ed, hi, it's Chris. Thanks for calling in tonight. I just have a couple questions. Thank you for this. This is yeah. helpful. The um, heating units, was that an unexpected and the, the, the a problem was discovered, or was that a change in scope? Yeah, that was that was actually that was um, two heating units that we were planning that were basically just for comfort heat. That's over by the elevator and by the uh, stage hall uh, entrance. That's internal to the building, and we were planning on reusing two uh, wall fins that were there um, after uh, uh, the renovations to the systems and, and tying in. Those two wall fins were found to not be functional, so we had to actually eliminate them. Now, per building code-wise, um, our ventilation air and our main heat is actually coming from other sources, like main mechanical units. These uh, three units were actually just for additional comfort heat in those spaces because there's so much exterior wall there and because the elevator shaft does tend to transmit some thermal cold. Okay, thank you. And then the, the furnace, because that can be costly. Was that not detected in the inspection or initial scope of work that it was old and might need to be replaced? I'm sorry, Chris, could you say that? I, I lost the first part of what you said. Which one? Uh, the, the, the furnace. Furn uh, uh, where do you, oh, see, for, I'm where sorry. do you see the furnace? I, I couldn't read the screen. I'm sorry. So furnish and install new circuit boiler room. Okay. Is that a cost? Yeah, that, that's just an... That's just an electrical cost, right, and in that's fact, that's a minor cost. Never We're estimating that. that's probably two to three thousand dollars that will fit into the FDA. I misheard you. I thought you said furnace, which is why I got concerned because that is an. Expensive. Oh no! Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. No, that that's just a, a particular <coughs> electrical circuit. Right. And just to, and is the whole Garland Company expense an additional add-on? Wasn't some of that expected? Right? No, no, no. The whole that, the whole, that whole Garland piece is their base contract. There are okay. no additional costs there. That was your the original amount for the roof. So they didn't have any change orders, which was good. Fantastic. Thank you. And just for for context, this um, this is all the stuff that was under under the bond, right? But then there's additional costs. Like the, like this doesn't include the auditorium, right? Yes, that's correct. So this is the bonded side of the project that the voters uh, had passed the referendum on. There's also the work being done at Stage Hall, which is directly being paid for out of the general fund uh, piece for the district. Now, those numbers are not represented here. These numbers that are represented are just the bonded referendum side. Is it possible that the other side of the project, that the, the add-on, could be in a chart like this because we're still voting on costs and then those costs may change and there could still be change orders on that piece as well. So if we could have that side of it too, then it will give us a much more complete picture, I think. Sure. Um, I, I may need a little assistance from like Lori Baum or um, uh, Jennifer um, Buscemi on that. Um, the other side, the district is actually doing is direct procurement. So through your um, you know, your business office, they're directly working with contractors to get that work done. So the reporting doesn't come through our office. Um, but I can coordinate with them and kind of format it in the similar format uh, with the information that they give me so we can see how we're doing on that side as well. That would be great. Yeah, that'd be helpful because I, I, you know, I think that as we wrap up the project and it's coming into clearer view, we should really be able to provide to the public a very clear picture of expenses, not just on the bond side, but on the additional costs. And I don't think we're there yet. 
but we should be there for us. Yeah, I think yep, this, is, this is super, super helpful and encouraging to see how few change orders there are in relation to the bonded part. Um, but I think it would be, yeah, we should definitely know kind of <clears> what, we're, what we're missing. It sounds like it's, you know, Sage Hall is going to be a big part of it, um, the asbestos removal. Um, right. Without knowing that, we, it's hard to do a happy dance. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> But, but it's good to see that the, the bonded part of it is um, getting finalized. Yeah, yeah. And we're getting very close to actually having all of the final costs and reports in from the contractors. So. Great. Any other questions? Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. We did a can you speak email to us and post it on the site? Yeah. Yeah, and actually Jeff just reminded me that he had forwarded it to me and I I in the craziness of the last week forgot to forward it along, so I apologize. <coughs> talk a little bit more about the Learning Center? Yeah. Okay, so um, in the transition over the last couple of weeks, uh, Mr. Malone and I had a chance to talk to Mr. Bernhauer, who was just here uh, Skyping in, I guess, or on a call. And um, we were specifically asking questions about when um, we could actually occupy the facility. And you heard this evening that um, they were pretty confident that by the 31st, for the most part, the actual building would be complete. And there would be some punch list items that needed to be completed after that. Um, what was not talked about was some significant construction um, that needs to be completed with regard to the wall uh, located in, at the exterior of the property. Uh, and that wall runs along the length of the property. Um, so Mr. Malone and I had a discussion with Mr. Bernhauer really focusing on two things. Number one was, first and foremost, safety concerns. What type of work would um, be, um, would, would happen in the rear of the building? What kinds of machines would need access to that area? And would our students be safe in the building during that period? Um, and uh, I concluded along with Mr. Malone that given the nature of the work that was going to transpire back there, that it would not be wise to move students in there until that work was completed, that is, the wall. So the next question we asked Mr. Bernhauer was, what is a reasonable time frame for the completion of that wall? And his answer was that um, from the formulation of the RFP to awarding the bid to allowing um, the company that is awarded the bid several weeks to uh, organize to the actual construction phase being completed, that runs about four months, best case scenario. So if you do the math, we're looking at you know, mid-April at the earliest uh, that that building would be, in, in my eyes at least, uh, appropriate for students to move in, uh, and possibly later than that. So I wanted to make the board aware of that and the community aware of that to just uh, set the, the timeline in a, in a real way um, for what lies ahead. So does that mean the expectation then would be we're really looking at, for the children at least, next school year? Well, that would be, um, that would be something to discuss further, but possibly. I mean, thankfully, we're in a position where the pre-K is housed in this building and the programs, um, I guess the sense of urgency is not there to move them in uh, the end of April or May. Um, and we could push it off until September. Um, but that's a decision you guys need to make at a, at a future point. But in terms of the timeline, best case scenario, we're looking mid-April. Mid uh, and the way construction goes, perhaps later. So it's the thinking that that even though we'd have a CBO and even though theoretically we could put kids there, we're going to basically choose not to in an overabundance of caution? Correct. 
And the thought, too, I think, is we're not going to be putting anybody in there, really. We're not moving the business office early, at least not in January, I don't think, correct? No. Because originally we talked about moving them over, and we had talked at some point about having daycare, although I think we've said in, in previous meetings, although I don't know if it's been definitive, that that will not be starting in January. It's important for parents to be aware of that. I mean, the nature, the description of the type of construction that needed to happen, that needs to happen in order for that wall to be built to the specs that we received from the architect, um, it's pretty invasive. And you have some pretty big machines back there, and I wouldn't want uh, pre-K students or any daycare, or even our employees there until that's completed. Thanks. I, I mean, I think everybody's obviously frustrated how long this has taken, how expensive it's been, but I appreciate Mr. Nichols looking into that and bringing that to everyone's attention as soon as possible. I think it's the right thing to do. Any other questions? Um, just to clarify, so there's the punch list that Tim was talking about, but then and then there's the wall, obviously, but beyond the punch list, then there's also other work that we were going to be handling internally, right, that would then yes. happen after the punch list is completed. So right. even after the punch list is done, there's still other internal work. Yes. What work is that? And the scope of that work, really, Paul, could Mr. Wilkin could speak to. But the, for all intents and purposes, if the wall was not what it was, we would be moving into that facility um, in January. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. We're going to move on to Pearson High School um, past events. I'll go through this really quick. Uh, gingerbread night. The Mr. Guyon, you want to talk a little bit about the YAWP student written plays at the end yeah, of the Yeah, it's a partnership with a program out of Stony Brook. Uh, they're masters of fine arts and writing and playwriting, um, and students work with uh, Mr. Shulman's class here, and they get an opportunity to try out playwriting, working with professional playwrights, and then a uh, committee chooses a student's play. Uh, in this case, this year, two student plays to be performed at the Abraham Theater in uh, Southampton. And uh, student actors, with the help of professional directors, put that on. And uh, we've had some musical performances. Uh, we've had the high school fall play, uh, which was wonderful. Do you want to speak real briefly, twice in one night, Mr. Guyon, about the IB <laughs> Disciplinary <laughs> Science Project? Sure. So, uh, this is the group four project. It's where all the students who take physics, chemistry, uh, biology, and environmental science get together. Uh, they're putting groups, um, interdisciplinary groups, and the students choose a topic to explore through the lens of each discipline. Um, so for example, they could choose uh, sharks and look at uh, the, the sharks swimming through physics trajectories, uh, their habitat through biology, uh, and their chemical makeup, for example. Great. It's a great project. It gets the classes together, working together. And then lastly, we, we participated in a literature live at Bay Street. Um, so we sent uh, most of our high school students, Mr. Guyon? All of them. All of them. And let's see if there's some pictures here. Upcoming uh, events, the early release drill, which we're required to do, um, is the 20th, which is the last day before break. So we get out at, uh, I think at the end of eighth period, everybody goes home. Um, Mr. Malone, what time do you get out? Um, 2.16. 2.16. I think we're 1.30. Uh, winter break, the 23rd to the 3rd. Next conversations with administrators is the 17th. Uh, regents exams, which is somewhat misleading. We don't have a lot of regents exams in January. That's mostly makeups. The prime uh, assessment period is in June. Um, end of the uh, marking period is the end of, which is really the f semester one, is the end of January, and that's when the senior class is ranked um, one last time for valedictorian and salutatorian purposes, uh, and spirit night the 24th uh, as well. Ms. Carriero, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Because Mr. Nichols touched upon this because we were shared building. So the eighth grade um, 
the entire eighth grade went to Anne Frank on the 22nd, as well as the seventh grade, this is our second year doing it, um, the It Takes Two documentary film festival that happens at Bay Street. They invited us over um, and we went on the fifth. We also had one high school group that also attended as well. Um, the chorus concert and as Ms. Tripp mentioned last Friday was the annual complete date. So here are some pictures from complete date. Mm -hmm. And it's also good for the kids right before the holidays to be very nice to their grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the seventh grade. It's interactive. Yes, they watch a documentary and then but they also learn of how they are made as well. And then this was spearheaded by Mr. Bramoff and the advisors, Mr. Terry, Ms. Caulfield, and Mr. Rainey. And it was an after school spirit night for our middle school, kind of to get them excited for the high school one. Um, so there was a Gaga tournament where we raised, I think, $200 for the middle school trips. Um, and then the girls' volleyball teams played each other, as well as our boys' basketball teams played each other. And it was very well attended. Up on the winter concert. Of course, they like to close right before they go on stage. <laughs> so, our last winter concert for the middle school is the band concert, which is tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, early re release drill, Mr. Nichols is correct. We get out at the end of eighth period for the middle high school, so it will be 1 31. Um, Mr. Terry is taking the kids on a ski trip to if they would like to. Um, to Wyndham, if a student cannot afford it, we will figure out a way for them to go. Um, and those are Saturdays, all day affairs. The kids are zonked by the time they get back, but it's really exciting for them. And we give lessons to kids. We don't just send them up in the gondola, don't worry. Um, the sixth grade will be going to West Hampton Beach to celebrate Chinese New Year and learn about it. Conversation with administrators on the 17th. And again, the marking period ends on the 24th. Mr. Malone. I'm going to hand you the torch. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Wonderful time of year at the elementary school. I think, um, Mr. Reynoso, is this one of the doors? Yes, it is. So um, throughout the building, there's just great things happening. Um, a lot of the classes have, have gotten involved in a little door decorating contest. So here's a beautiful quote just kind of uh, exemplifies what's going on around the building. Some of, the, some of the past events to highlight. Uh, big thanks to our PTA. Um, as you know, they, they really uh, throw their heart and souls into a lot of great activities for the um, elementary children and their families. Two examples were the, the book fair, which um, was right around the uh, Thanksgiving, right before Thanksgiving. Really successful. Mm -hmm. And um, to kick off the holiday season, they support the gingerbread night on, on the 6th. And then we rolled into the performing arts season. So we had a great concert the other night. All the different performing groups shared their talents. And just today, our um, dance club kicked the morning off with a, a great um, holiday-themed show. And then this afternoon, our third grade shared their performing arts event. Here's some more of the, the great doors the kids are really enjoying, enjoying decorating the doors along with their teachers. Because we're gonna have to give out some prizes, huh? Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. Yeah. This is it. This picture is. This is a great um, shot of today's performing arts show. And not only are the students up on stage speaking and singing, they are also um, behind the scenes for probably the last few months uh, putting together all the stagecraft, the, um, the backdrops, their their costuming, working on the choreography. It's. Um, Really a big undertaking, but a um, you know a wonderful process that the kids are involved in, and they they learn a lot of great skills as a part of the performing arts program. This was a story about um, Hanukkah that was read this morning by Miss Cohen. It's a great shot to the concert. And then upcoming um, for the remainder of the week, the different shows continue. Our, our fourth grade do an annual winter museum. It's probably been a place in school for about 20 years. So each of the students 
do some research around a winter activity or specifically a holiday tradition in their household and then the classrooms become the museum and the families come in and enjoy seeing all their work. And then we'll close things out on the 20th with our release drill. We do release at 216 as I said. And then when we get back from the recess, we actually start up the um, swimming program. And for those that aren't aware, we send our first and through fifth graders to the Y and they, they take an initial lesson, kind of assess where they're at as swimmers, and then they're involved in instruction, which is um, led by Ms. Reynoso and our uh, PE teachers. So it's, it's a big undertaking, but I think this might be like our 15th. Is that right? 15 years. 15th year of, of this program. And, uh, it's just a great way to um, expose kids to that wonderful facility, but also hopefully ensure that they're safe in, the, in and around the water, which is such a big part of their life here on the East End. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the athletics update. Our past events show some highlights from the fall. We really have, uh, we're going to finish up the uh, fall season. We just had all our um, postseason coaches awards were given out. Uh, we had several athletes uh, get pretty prestigious awards in terms of all state, all county. And uh, they're going to be awarded on uh, one of our upcoming events. It's going to be the fall varsity athletic awards night. We're going to have it in the auditorium at 7 o'clock uh, on the 19th. And we're going to honor the varsity fall teams. And we're going to, uh, this is a little bit different than the formats we've used previously. So we're planning on having a varsity athletic awards night for each of the seasons. And then at the end of the season, uh, we're planning something uh, a little bit different for the seniors, for the senior athletes, to give them a send off. Um, so we're, that'll be the first time we've utilized this format where we're going to actually have three separate award ceremonies. Late winter sports begin, uh, you know, Mr. Malone always says the calendar just keeps turning. Uh, late winter sports begins, which marks the uh, halfway point of our athletic calendar uh, on January 21st. Spirit Night, uh, for those of you who've never attended, uh, it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing night. It really en encapsulates not only our varsity and, and uh, teams, as well as the, the youth basketball program, which is very healthy here in our community. Uh, spring sports begin on the 9th, on 3-9, and uh, our final sports season starts on 3-23. And do we have any, uh, I have some, several photos. Uh, the one on the left there, I believe, is from the Field Hockey Coaches Association dinner. We were very well represented at all our coaches association dinners. Uh, I feel like I say it every year, we had a very successful fall. Uh, our students and coaches should be commended for their efforts. Uh, we had a uh, representative, this is our girls cross country team. They won the class D county title. They represented us up in Plattsburgh. I believe it was like 32 degrees out, a little snow. And Mr. Fisher would be up next. Is there any questions? <coughs> what time is Thursday? Did you say seven? Thursday's at seven. We're gonna have a, rece a light reception at six thirty in the uh, in the lobby outside of the auditorium. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. I'm gonna give you a quick update. I think much of this information I've, I've gone over previously, but I just want to uh, revisit it quickly to let you know where we're at. We're in pretty good shape with regards to. Um, making our way back to 100%. We're still not there yet, but we have accomplished quite a bit. I mentioned previously that we've added some um, software both on the back end and the front end to help us um, minimize any chance of, of um, any type of future problems. Um, all of the user devices, whether they're student or staff, uh, for the most part at this point have been wiped clean, reformatted, and we put the new software on there for the protection. Um, the slowest part of that process, unfortunately, is we took off the user files um, before we wiped the machines clean and getting those back because there's just a tremendous amount of information that people have collected over the years. So it's taking us a tremendous amount of time to get that off of the external drive and back to them. But we are making uh, steady progress with that. Um, this past week, the computer labs 
um, were set up. They're not 100% functional yet, but they should be by the end of this week, which of course means actually the start of the, the year um, upon returning from the, the break. But this lab here and the, the lab next door was done. The elementary school lab work was done on that as well. Um, and now we're moving on to the Pearson art rooms, which have their own sets of uh, devices. So Mr. Solo's room, for the most part, is done. He still needs some software added, but um, the machines downstairs for the middle school art room um, were in the process of being done uh, yesterday and today. And then the last set of art room uh, devices would be in uh, Mr. Bartolotto's room. So we're working on that. At this point, we recreated all of the servers. Um, so the visitor check-in system up front is working. The employee badge system is fully functional, the time clocks. The camera and security system, for the most part, is working. I say for the most part because some of the older cameras that were, um, that were not a part of the newer solution we put in, we're having some problems with them, but we're, we're working to get those cameras um, working or fixed um, as well. Uh, and the, the, the last hurdle, really the big one for us, is the, the print server. That um, is something that we continue to work on. Um, we have printers in every class, and we want to make sure that the devices, both the student and the staff, that they can print it for the time being. I believe we have at least set up where um, there's common printers throughout each of the buildings that people can print to, so they're no longer um, as stuck with printing issues as they were previously. And perhaps maybe this will force people to cut down a little bit on their printing and <laughs> share information digitally um, as a result. Um, we also updated our firewall. We've secured some things in there. We, our wireless controls have been reconfigured. Um, we've actually established new wireless networks. You might see some new names. That's, that's what's going on with that. Um, we actually have some that, that um, you might not even be aware of. But the whole purpose of that is to segment the devices um, to make sure that we have um, our devices that the school owns um, have access to certain things and devices that other people bring into the district be limited um, even further than they, they were previously. And we've also established a, a whole new backup system. So um, we're making some, some real progress with regards to that. Um, uh, Tim, is, he's gone already. Um, Tim might have, you know, he's gone over some of this already, but the audio-visual equipment, uh, that's the large group instruction space, that picture at the top, that was similar to the picture Tim showed. It'll be duplicated on the opposite side of the room as well. Um, the installation of the cameras and security devices, um, when I wrote this today, it was to begin soon, it started. The guy's actually there now waiting for me to meet him. So um, that work is underway. We hope to keep moving forward with as much of that as we can. That bottom corner picture is very hard to see, but that's actually the fire alarm system in the far corner. And then in the center of that picture is our data rack. So the equipment has been racked. It's just not physically connected and, and uh, giving us uh, network traffic across there crush yet. The security door locks and the camera installation, oh, I, I doubled that up, I said I did fix it, sorry. Um, it actually began today, so that, that work is underway right now as we speak and we're going to keep moving forward with that. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Um, one question I had on the sure. first slide. Um, so you said user files are in process of being scanned and returned. Where in the process are we on that? I have every user's files on an external drive. I've started um, loading them up into Google Drive and just sharing them back to them. So at this point, I'm going to guess I'm maybe a third or more through that. It's, it's really time consuming. When I, know this, when I look at the upload time that it says, it says 176,000 hours. That's how long it's going to take to upload. And that's just a few of the people. And the reason for that is we have pictures and all sorts of things that we're really doing our best to try to retain for everybody. So it is taking us a long time. But um, yeah, I think it was just an important thing for everyone to be aware of because I know there was we've gotten some questions from community members saying, you know, why haven't the minutes from this meeting been posted? And in some cases, it might be a teacher that was taking the minutes, and the minutes were on their laptop before the cyber attack. They haven't gotten them back yet. Similarly, teachers would have other types of documents that they're still waiting on. So. Yeah, so um, it can be a challenge them, and everybody's been extremely patient and understanding. I think they're just happy that we're telling them this hope that you know th th their work isn't completely lost, so they're, they're being patient. And of course, if somebody has an absolute immediate need, there's one teacher in particular that I can think of that, that are really super, I, I, I need this like today. We, we got the files that day, and, and everybody else has been very patient. So, um, yeah. Thanks so much, Scott. I, I think one question. Sure. Um, thank you. This is very helpful. And thank you for the work you're doing. It's, um, it's just a lot of heavy lifting, I know. Um, currently, what's the impact to the children in terms of the classroom experience? 
Um, I would have to have the building administrator speak to that. The, I'm sure the teachers are not you know, excited about the way things have been. I think it, they've been steadily improving. Um, we've been trying to be supportive to them and provide them what they need, but I, that would be more of a question for the administrators, whether that's you know, significantly impacting the instruction. I'm sure when the computers are completely offline, yeah. right. it it, it, just it. instruction in a different way. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the elementary school. For those first few days, there obviously had to take place a shift because everybody had been in the flow of mm -hmm. taking out the computers, using them as needed. Um, but once once people kind of realized that we were down for a bit, the adjustment was made pretty quickly. Um, Scott and his team got the um, the Chromebooks, which at the elementary school, the fourth and fifth graders, especially this time of year when they're completing different projects, they, they rely on those, but they got those back in the hands of the kids pretty quickly. So I'd say, um, you know, for the most part right now, we're in, we're in a pretty good place. Printing remains a bit of an issue, but um, we're getting back back to speed there. And Scott, um, is it the smart the smart notebook? You know? That's that's, that's gone out now at this point. Okay. So the teachers that have requested that, um, we we did notice an issue that if the teachers weren't acknowledging because the software was pushed out to them, they had to accept a security setting, and if they didn't realize that. It didn't have its full functionality, but now that we've figured that out, um, we've revisited and they have the full functionality of the writing tools for the teachers that use it. Not all of our teachers use that software, but those that do um, really, really like it. So yeah, yeah. So at this point in time, we're I'd say we're in a pretty good place as far as classroom instruction and okay. technology support. I would say similar for the high school. Um, immediately following, there was some immediately following the. The uh, cyber attack, there was some panic um, amongst teachers in terms of having their lesson plans stored and those kinds of things, but people adapt and, and move forward. And um, we've been in the classrooms conducting observations pretty regularly, uh, Mike, Brittany, and myself. And from your perspective, well, things look like they're going pretty I well. I think right? the biggest thing is the printing's a pain for the teachers, so that's the biggest strong point. But I also think Let me, I just want to explain why the printing is taking so long. Each device has to be physically visited. We have to um, attach a network device to it and, and, and get some information out. And then we have to make some physical changes both at the printer side and in the server closet in order for it to be on the new network. So that's why it's, it's a Time physically going from, from device to device. So that's why it's taking um, longer than we'd hoped. We're saving some trees in the process. I'm sorry? We're saving some trees in the mm -hmm. process. I hope so. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we can move on to the consent agenda. And if everyone wants to make sure they're logged in. Can I get a motion to approve items 8.1 through 8.22? So moved. Second. Second. Unanimous. Can I get a motion to approve item 9.1, uh, the affiliation agreement with Stony Brook? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, could, could there just be a you know a, a one two minute explanation of what this is because it's a little different than some what we've done in the past. I think it'd be helpful. <coughs> sure, I can do that for you. Mm -hmm. So this is an affiliation agreement with SUNY Stro Stony Brook to allow occupational therapy interns to intern in the Sag Harbor School District. It also opens up opportunities for other folks in that department, such as physical therapy, to also intern. It does so two main things. One is it gives us an opportunity to help our related service personnel in those areas to work at the top of their professional licensure um, by interacting with professors and interns. and. Um, 
and being exposed to new, new um, research in the field. It also gives an opportunity for folks to come and learn about the Santa Barbara School District and the South Fork, and hopefully track some related service providers to this area. As you know, we've had some trouble getting a physical therapist when we had our current contract of physical therapist out. So this is an opportunity to build capacity to support students with special needs on the East Coast. Thank you. Any other discussion? Thank you. We get a motion to approve item 9.2, um, the approval of the United Public Services Employees Union Side Harbor Bus Drivers Union Memorandum of Agreement for donation of sick days. Okay. Any discussion? Motion to approve the uh, memorandum of agreement for donation of sick days with respect to the side proper teaching assistance. So moved. Motion to approve the appointment of uh, 9.4, appointment of Lori Baum as school business administrator. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Welcome aboard and thank you. Thank you. Motion to accept, uh, so 9.5, accept Larry Baum's letter of resignation with respect, with respect to her old position of assistant to the school business administrator. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Motion for 9.6 to appoint Rashida Wallace as assistant to the school business administrator. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yes, I'm going to be voting no, and I just want to go on the record it is not in reflection to this particular candidate, but I feel like the process was not done properly. Typically, if you're going to be posting for a job like this in this district or others, it would be posted for at least one to two weeks, have time for evaluation of resumes, a proper interview process and then a selection and appointment. Um, this was posted last Wednesday, only posted from Wednesday to Friday, and Thursday night, the agenda was posted with the candidate already selected. So I don't feel like the process afforded to have um, the proper search to see if there were anyone in the community or surrounding districts or anywhere else that um, might be an interesting candidate. And again, not a reflection on her, but not only was this not a perfect process, I think it was a very broken process and unfair to those that might have been qualified and, and uh, could have participated properly if it had been done from my perspective the right way. Jeff, do you care to talk to what the process was? Sure. Um, so, um, so Ms. Graves, uh, the position for the business administrator was originally posted uh, several months ago and she convened or asked Mr. Malone, myself, Ms. Carriero, and Ms. Lawrence to sit on the interview committee, which we did. And we interviewed um, the candidates that she presented to us and uh, we found uh, two candidates out of the um, applicant pool to be impressive. Um, so she offered uh, one of the candidates the business administrator position and that was Lori Baum who you approved uh, several minutes ago, and there was another candidate um, who the committee was impressed with, uh, and she decided to appoint that candidate uh, to the assistant to the school business administrator position, uh, even though she had applied for the uh, business administrator position. Um, so that was her thinking, and I, um, 
it's sort of analogous, although it's not an exact analogy, that in the past um, I've advertised for probationary track teaching positions. For instance, let's say I had a uh, 7 through 12 English position. Um, I've gone through the interview process with the committee, selected a candidate uh, that was to our liking uh, to the teaching position, but we had another candidate who we were also impressed with who we appointed or recommended would be appointed to a teacher assistant position that um, we didn't post for. So I think that was Miss uh, Miss Graves' thinking in this situation. She found two good candidates and she thought she could fill the two positions um, with those two candidates. Thank you for that clarification. Any further discussion? Okay, that is five yes and two opposed. Chris Tice and your vote. A motion to approve 9.7, the corrective action plan. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> just want to thank the members of the art committee. I think we've had a very really qualified and very active art committee this year under Susan's uh, chairmanship, chairpersonship. And uh, so I think the process has been very productive. And thank you to Lori for putting the corrective action plan together. Yes. She has been going above and beyond. And now she actually has the title of the administrator, <laughs> even though she's been doing a lot of those speeches around, so thank you. to approve um, item 10.10, .10, adopting policy 7518 with respect to concussion management. So moved. Second. Any discussion? committee reports. Uh, we had a request for the Transportation Committee to make a presentation. Um, I just wanted to update the board a little bit. Um, the Transportation Committee met last week or last. Um, if you recall the last time the Transportation Committee came and presented, um, we gave you the options for adding another bus and that sort of thing based on the um, report from the consultant. And, and then the next Part of that puzzle was like, what do you want to do with the Transportation Committee next? The Transportation Committee was interested in exploring safe routes to school. Um, I got the green light from the board at that time. So um, as a committee, we started looking at um, the Safe Routes to School grant. Um, apparently that grant is no longer funded through the federal government, but there is another grant that is similar and kind of um, can umbrella Safe Routes to School type um, funding projects and it's a transportation alternative programs, um, and it's funded through the federal government um, and the New York State Department of Transportation. So as I was um, reading up on that grant and what it can do, I saw that um, basically the way it works is that the grant will pay for 80% of funding of projects that um, support biking, walking, those sorts of things. And I saw on the list of the last go-round with the grant that Southampton Town was a recipient of the grant on the last round. Um, so I called Tommy Jones Kivani and I said, hey, do you know anything about this? And he said, yes, as a matter of fact, we got some bike paths and multi-use paths to connect the village and the beaches and these sorts of things. So um, there was a Safe Routes to School initiative kind of locally by residents um, to try and get that ball rolling several years ago now. Um, and at that time, the um, village wasn't 
um, prepared to move forward on that project because um, the deal with the grant is that you have to pay up front for all that project and you get reimbursed for 80% of it, so you'd have to bond out for the project. Um, and I think they weren't sure how to do that or what that might look like or those sorts of things. With um, new mayor in the village and some new trustees, I made a phone call to Aiden Korish, who's now a village trustee, and I had lunch with him and Tommy John and said, you know, if, how does this work with respect to, like, if we want to start getting sidewalks that connect our school with the surrounding neighborhoods so that we can increase um, the safety of students walking, this sort of thing, like, what might that look like? And, and basically the outcome of that conversation was that if, if we as a school community wanted to explore um, what that might look like and then we presented it to the town and the village and possibly East Hampton and said, hey, you know, this is what the school would love to see. Um, here's the grant, here's how it could be funded, you know, this sort of thing, then um, the municipalities can take the ball and run with it. Um, we as a school district cannot apply for that grant. It has to be the municipalities and the reason I think that it's been so challenging to do anything like that up until now is because our Sac Harbor community is in three municipalities. We've got the village and we've got students in Southampton and East Hampton. Um, but as everybody in the school community knows, it's, it's challenging to have a safe walking path even for people that live a couple of blocks or a couple of houses away from the school because we don't have sidewalks and that sort of thing. So um, when we had talked to the mayor about the sidewalks, she was definitely open to enforcing um, the clearing of the sidewalks, which she did on this last storm. Um, letters went out, citations went out, uh, a period of summons went out, so she's definitely on board with respect to making sure that the sidewalks around the school are safe for our kids. So I think the next thing that the transportation committee would like to do is explore um, what it might look like to get a larger project to fund connecting the sidewalks in our community because um, it's very sporadic. So that would involve engaging stakeholders, um, surveys, this sort of thing, a lot of legwork. Um, the Transportation Committee is willing to do some of that legwork, but I think we just kind of need um, the thumbs up from the board because ultimately as a subcommittee of the EFPC, we're to advise the board on matters of policy and these sorts of things, whereas this kind of um, goes outside the scope of what affects just the board decisions because we would be reaching other to, out to other municipalities and things like that. So I guess basically um, we would continue to come back and keep you guys in the loop, loop as, as our progress, but we did want to um, make sure that the board wanted us to move forward on this because it's a, it would be a a big project and a big undertaking, but I think the school community is, is the best place to bridge that gap between the three municipalities. So, so first of all, you've done an enormous amount of legwork on this, so thank you. Um, it's a great update. So just to understand, the application has to go in from a municipality. They have to be the sponsor. Mm -hmm. Correct. So I would think that it would make sense to find, to try to see who could be the lead sponsor as a municipality, and then we work with them, but they take the lead. Um, because we, we can't own that process if we can't apply for it. And it really isn't, to your point, the charter of committees. But I do think that, and I know, I mean, I remember going to meetings of the community group that couldn't get traction, and it was the municipality piece. So I think it makes sense for municipality to lead it. And if, if there's some folks from the transportation committee that want to participate on their effort, um, I think that's great. But I don't think this is something that a board committee or subcommittee should be should be leading just because of that piece. Um, and then, you know, it, and coordinating with the other municipalities, and, and I'm willing to see that as a, necessarily the role of a committee per se. But I think the work you've done is great in identifying it, and I hope we can come together. The other piece is not just connecting the sidewalks. We have a lot of sidewalks within a five block radius that are hazardous to walk on unless you're looking down, where it sticks up, it sticks down, and I mean, you know, it's easy to trip. So I think, I think, you know, any conversations about this is not just connecting what we have, but fixing what's already there. And, and that is in the domain of Psych Harbor Village, for example. the village. That's, the, that's a village you issue specifically. Village. So, you know, to me, you know, kind of start in a circle and move out. So I think that's an easier conversation to have, too. And the I love the idea of the fact that with new leadership, they're actually summoning that you have to clear because any big snowstorm, you see kids and community members walking in the street, and that's, you know, that's. A serious incident waiting to happen. 
I think the um, thinking that the the village and the towns um, will and take the initiative to start this project um, probably won't go anywhere because um, ultimately it's the in the interest of our school community to um, be in partnership with them to see what that might look like with what our constituents want. Um, and oh, and there's Kendor. We were just talking about it. Come on. <laughs> Um, <laughs> kids on the transportation committee with me. Um, I think that just to bring you up to speed on the conversation, um, I just shared with the community like kind of where we are in the process and Chris's feedback was that um, maybe it isn't the role of the transportation committee and that maybe the, the municipalities should um, do that initiative. Um, based on my conversation with um, Tommy John and Aiden, um, what I wanted to propose is that we use our human capital as a school community to help move this project forward because ultimately we're, the, the school is in the village but it's the school's um, parents aren't necessarily in the village. So I'm not in the village, I'm not a village resident, Ken is not a village resident, so we don't have much say in the village but as a school community, I think that um, they'd be more willing to listen to um, the needs of the school. And so we kind of need that endorsement of the board that this is something that the school wants. Um, and also that, you know, the village has a very small footprint and it has not a lot of resources and, and we have a lot of human capital. And so I'm willing to volunteer my time, the committee's willing to volunteer their time um, and kind of take some initiative. I invited the chief of police to our last meeting um, to kind of talk through these issues and I just think that um, I think the, the school does need to take a leadership role on this if we actually want to see it happen that's in my view but yes um, we would then go to the municipalities and say this is where we see the issues and this is what we see the fixes to be um, would you be willing to work with us to make these things happen and then at that point I mean basically we need to come to them with what we want as opposed to just say you know what you should do you know what you should do you know what you should do because We've been doing that for about 10 years, and I haven't done this very far. So, and just clarity, can I said I think it's great. I just felt that based on the fact that a municipality has to lead the lead the be the underwriter and lead it, that not having them lead it and having us lead it seems problematic. And we've got a fourth municipality, which is North Haven, right? South Haven Town. All of it is. So North Haven is not involved at all. The government is not involved at all with any of that. They have their own highway department, so it would be. St. Harbor has their own highway department, so right. how it works is they have uh, IMAs and municipal agreements right. to, to do that. All right, so then they defer to South Hampton own, proper. But it would tell him because of the tax basis, as okay. Diana was saying, All right, would right. come through on that, but it would have to be a St. Harbor application supported, mm -hmm. as I understand, supported by the town of East Hampton and the town of South Hampton because the village has its own highway department, which is responsible for sidewalks, roads, except for any state highway. So would one municipality have to be the lead on it when it's submitted, or can all three do it jointly? They'd have to do their own areas. So each, each three have to do their own. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm hearing is that I, mean, I think it's a great idea. I think we should pursue it. I think just logistically, if you start with the village and then have a point person, Tommy John mm -hmm. at South Hampton, mm -hmm. one of the town, one of the council mm -hmm. people in East Hampton, that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, like, the trans like the committee is saying, I think that's the most productive. But I think it has to come, I think, and I could be wrong, it has to come as a village application since they have their own highway department. Right, exactly. Makes so sense. the commonality amongst all of the municipalities is the school, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why you think it should come from the school and it's the safe walking to school. Well, coordination by the school, not right. it can't come but, from the school. Right, that right. Coordination, coordination, but my point the is the only commonality connecting all of it is the school. Um, and you're not asking to expend any school resources at this time, just the time that the transportation committee members are willing to spend on yeah. it. So, I, I mean, I think I would so support that. I think, I think great that's idea. a great idea, and, you know, I would support that as well. And then I'm sure that you'll report back as, yep. as you know, once you get closer, and then you would have to send it to the municipalities to, so they would have to take the lead to get it right. done. So it's more right. like getting legwork done. To get them motivated to yeah. do it. Yep. And coordinated. Are, do you sense, I mean, this may be a premature answer, do you sense of the three municipalities, is, is there a reason why they would need to sit down together to try to coordinate any of this, or is it really three separate tracks? 
I, it, well, it would be three separate submittals. Mm -hmm. um, but again, preliminarily, we, we haven't even fleshed out any details because at our last meeting we were like, okay, so the, the committee was all on board That's great. to put it forward. Yeah. And then they, we said, what's next steps? And they said, we need to go to the Board of Education and make sure that we have the support of the board before we go rogue and <laughs> like right. start, right. start reaching out to stakeholders and saying, hey, like, where do you see the problems in your area? Because I, mean, I, I think you I, would, and I think what it is is they want to see what your plan was. So right. you start closest to the school which is, with funding which is the sidewalks. Well, no, but, but just saying that like, that's where the plan would start. And, right. Um, even though the school lies on the East Hampton side of the village, it's still part of the village. So I think you'd start at the closest proximity to the school and you build a master plan as you build sidewalks and get funding on the way out. Well, that application could be then the same thing all three submit. Right. And, and ultimately, like, we do have to reach out to stakeholders because I know the issues that are near my house, but I don't know the issues that are directly around the school. And so we, we have to engage the school community on, on where they see the pockets of need. And it, it, may be, yep. it may be interesting actually to do that earlier, early on, because that would be something compelling to bring to the municipalities as you speak to them. If there was, let's say, and I'm using this just as an exa example, but if there was a survey that went out to parents saying, you know, are there challenges, you know, do, do your children walk or bike to school? If not, why? Would there be anything that could be changed that you would feel comfortable them doing it or they'd be motivated? You know, just getting some of that because if there's some information or data that can be brought, that might, you know, that might clarify what should be done, but also kind of demonstrate, hey, your voters, your community wants this. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's I think you're fleshing out kind of what Diana was saying when she said we should have surveys. So I think you're on the same page. Yeah. And uh, I think it sounds like a great idea. So, mm -hmm. oh, Mr. Dorf, is there anything you'd like to add to the? Oh, here you go. Is it all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No <coughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, if you give me just a couple of uh, minutes, just a little, also very, very brief backgrounds. A lot of you know that I've been on this transportation thing for like 25 years. Yes, and I was about 20 when I started. <laughs> and, and Matt knows. Actually, when Matt met me the first, year, you thought I worked for this like for a career, right? Mm -hmm. Spent transportation class, a bike, blah, blah. blah. And it, someday, if you want to know about the Safe Bruce School and the tragedy of how that fell apart, please talk to me, because it really was an important uh, failure. We learned a lot from that, about this question of municipalities. This is the first time in the 20, 30, almost 30 years I've lived here that the village and the school board can be aligned. That's a fact. They've been at war, they've been in different places, but this is a window, and I want to take advantage of this window while we have it. Um, there, are, there are a lot of ideas that people have had over the years. A couple of things. It's not just the school that's the common alley. The village has all kinds of ideas, uh, which will be, I'm also on the village transportation committee separately. The village has its own ideas, but the school can be a driver we, we, for our needs. And I think that's what we want to focus on. Many questions like, why is there no parking here? And, and, and if, why are there no, no sidewalks around either school so we can't have drop-off? Why is there no snow removal? There's so many questions that we have. The village is open, really open to work with us. So we really should take advantage of this. Chris, you said something I think is very important. We need a baseline, because <clears throat> we want to show, and we did a lot of that with the Safe Houston School, but that's a long time ago, how kids get to school, what the obstacles are, where parents drive, et cetera. Um, we have a lot, a lot of opportunity right now, but one of the things I want to do is, is work with you to get your approval that this is more than just busing. It's also about bikes and walking and parking mm -hmm. and everything else. And also that we can work together to do some surveys so we have a baseline which will also help with our um, proposals. Um, I, I, there's more I can say, but I think that's the main story. And, and it would be great if we got on board with this. Oh, kids, biking and walking is actually less today. It's less than it was 20 years ago. And we have less biking and walking than other schools of similar sizes. Similar. We're really not in great shape for that. Uh, lots of traffic, you know. We could do a lot better. And I think it, with the right infrastructure, with the village cooperating, I think we can do a lot better. Okay. Any questions for me? Who would you recommend the first steps are? Two things, a survey, right. and also working with, as, as uh, Diana said, working with different subgroups, like we did last time, to say what are your needs. Uh, talking about biking, talking about parking, talking about drop-off, talking about... And, and when you mean survey, like feedback in the community or physical survey, like... Both, actually. So, I mean, one of the things we're working with the village on separately, but this is really important, is where are their sidewalks? I mean, you know, throughout Sarah Carver, yeah. there's sidewalks that and they come, stop. They and they go nowhere. And they go nowhere. Uh, yeah, there's lots of obvious places for sidewalks, like Grand Street. I mean, people could drop off their kids right there. They're right. on a sidewalk. Um, so things like that. First, the physical infrastructure, okay. exactly. 
uh, of where kids are walking, where they could walk. And then also uh, a sense of how gets to, kids get to school today. There are a lot of kids who could walk and bike. There are a lot of kids who could park in different places. We don't know, right? We don't have that data right now, I believe. Correct? Right. Uh, but we could. We did, lot, we, we did some informal surveys last time. We had a lot of good, good information. And um, just one, one point. Uh, I, I, at that time, when we did the San Francisco School application, we were told that we had the best <coughs> application in New York State. In New York State, half a million dollars, but the village never applied. Just so you know that that's that was it was one of the tragic moments of my life. <laughs> really, I sort of withdrew for a while. But I, I really think we have an opportunity right now. Great. I really do. So let's so, make it happen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. I guess the only thing uh, he brings up a great point is if we did do a survey. Um, I, obviously, the the easiest way to do that is to have. Scott helps push that out to the school community, and I, I guess maybe that might, I don't know if that considers an expense, because I don't think it costs us anything, but that would be using school resources, if you will. So I guess that's kind of why we want to make sure the board's, mm -hmm. you know, supports the endeavor. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, sure. In support of that. Yeah. Thanks, Dean. Okay, and just one thing I realized that also, I'm not sure that municipalities cannot work together, because last time we were able, Sag Harbor had to leave it, lead it. But Southampton and East Townton were able to support it. Awesome. So, so there can, if that, if that's the same thing, we can get them because here in Long Island you have to work together, given the way things are structured. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Um, are there any other committees that want to provide any updates? I can just give a brief uh, policy committee update. I just want to let folks know we created a shared drive for the current committee members in order to put current, future, and archived material and resources, make them a little more accessible. We completed a comprehensive review and table of context, uh, contents for uh, the policy committee manual, and we did a comparison between what was online in the Erie One manual and what we had hard copy, because we know we had to kind of upload some of those, and you'll see like for the concussion policy we put forth because there was a third read but not an approval. So we're just reviewing everything and making sure everything's good and, and packed together. We're currently working on the fundraising policy and the facilities use and we had some current update requests from Erie Board of BOCES and we'll keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to add um, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee is really doing well, really thriving. Um, Two highlights are the subcommittee that was formed uh, to create diverse classroom libraries um, in collaboration with John Germain Library is moving along as a result of a survey that was submitted to our teachers who made specific requests on how to make their classroom libraries more diverse. As a result, John Germain has committed to donating at minimum two books per class. As a start, looking at those lists, to create diversity in the classroom. And then the other uh, subcommittee is one on films, uh, tough topics. We just had an event yesterday at John Germain Library. That was the Green Book. And we had two uh, key speakers who were a part of that time and discussed what that experience was like, which was also really positive and, and enlightening. <coughs> Any other committee reports? Okay. Um, any other business anyone wants to raise? All right. Uh, we'll go to public input two. If there's anybody here for public input two, please come forward, state your name. You have three minutes. Hi, Sandy Curl. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Um, I'd like to start with um, the sound system especially with this, uh, both myself and Caleb could barely hear opening comments or anything. So it is getting worse. Uh, maybe it's the cold or everybody's got or whatever, but we're all like, what are you, what are you saying? Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Um, number two, I would like to thank Jeff for his honesty on Stella Maris. It was quite refreshing to actually be told the truth and to know what's ahead of us. Um, so I guess my backup question to that would be, is the contract of every month stipend for the architects going to continue through the building of the wall? Because then we're talking a lot of money that we'll have paid them without public approval. Um, so I would, I would 
like an answer to that. Um, resolution 815. I feel like I've seen her name before on the resolutions, last meeting maybe, but I also noticed it's backdated again from November. I thought it was on the last one and backdated. Um, I could be wrong, um, but just it hit me odd. Um, and the last is the process of which we discussed on a candidacy. You are required to follow policy and procedure. And you don't get to change it because something happened without your knowledge or not knowing it. Jobs are posted internally. I went on OLAFs to look the job up. It was not under school business leader. It was under Pearson. So unless you were specifically looking for a school to go work at, which I don't think Pearson at the end of East End, at the East End is probably high on a lot of people's lists, you're going to get many applicants. The rumor mill has been flying all week about it, so I applaud the two board members that voted no on the process, not necessarily the person. Um, my advice, or I will say that I would respect you to follow the same policy and procedure, not it happens sometimes, but to follow the same one all the time. It's much more professional. It definitely doesn't get us into trouble or into conversations like we're having tonight. So I wanted to say that. And then, are we now going to allow, thanks for coming in, Ken. So like I had a, I wanted to raise issues on the policy that we were discussing. Should I just raise my hand and come up to the podium and spoke then? Or are we waiting for public input to speak? I don't know what it is. I will answer change. that one, even though we're not usually going to respond. No, but, no, you should respond. But, Thank um, you. No, but Ken's part of the transportation committee, so he was supposed to be part of that presentation. He so was helped up and was waiting until oh, oh, he was part so, of it. So it was a presentation. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, and sorry, Diana, asked you, otherwise they wouldn't have said anything. I know, you can. I, I, I'm all about sidewalks, so I just <laughs> want to know if there's something <laughs> different since I said every meeting. I was sitting in front like this, waiting well, for someone yes. to. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else for public input? I do. Hi, uh, Dominic Clapp here, um, resident at Carver. How are you all? Well, um, I was. I want to tell you, I was really touched. I watched the last meeting on the video. I don't know if you've ever really done that. It was nice mm -hmm. and short. Um, it's nice to do. I was really touched by the presentation, Sandy, about the previous uh, principal, mm -hmm. Jeff, and all those that you talked. Especially, it's nice to see your dad. Um, mm -hmm. And it reminded me of something that's really important. So I gather, I went to look at the paper, and I saw that that plaque was dedicated on October 3rd, 2003. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Sag Harbor Learning Center. And I'd like you to think back, what was your life like in 2003? And project far ahead to that same period. What will 20 years from now? that new facility look like to us. I think it's going to be as equally indispensable as this addition has been to us. And you, this board here, needs to be laying the groundwork for that to be the great success it can be. I know you have a lot of heavy lifting to do in the next six months. You're going into a new superintendent search. Welcome. You're going to be figuring out how to spend our taxpayer money. But you're also going to be laying the groundwork, and Chris brought it up, is how we're going to make some revenue, how we're going to program that building, and make it the wonderful thing it can be. And I'd like you to think about that over the holidays. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else here for public input? All right. Um, with that, can I get a motion to convene executive session to discuss a legal matter? Sure. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Well, you know? Get a two minute vote. Mm -hmm. oh, no, no. Get a vote on. Uh,